Well, this is Mark Unkefer, and uh, I am Executive Director of the Fiber Optic Sensing Association, and welcome to our January webinar, Fiber Optic Sensing for Highway Applications. And we're very privileged to have one of the great subject matter experts on transportation issues within FOSA, uh, and Andy Hall of uh, OptiSense, which is uh, in the last few months, become a, a lunar company. So we're really looking to learn about some of the ways in which sensing can uh, work along the roadways. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Mark. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Um, hi, everybody, and thanks for tuning in to this FOSA webinar on fiber optic sensing for highway applications. Um, my name is Andy Hall and I am responsible for the management and development of products within the transportation industries for OptiSense. This webinar aims to showcase the applications of the technology for the fast changing highways industry that are here today and also to look at some of the applications that are on the horizon. Before we begin, I want to say a few words about uh, the company I work for, OptiSense. We are market leader in fiber optic monitoring solutions. We were founded in 2007 with our headquarter in the UK and offices in locations uh, around the world, uh, including the USA. At the end of last year, we were acquired by Lunar Innovations. Um, also an American developer and, and manufacturer of fiber optic products for multiple industries. We work across a number of industries to help optimize their operations with our products and are well versed at helping get in technology adopted uh, within a new industry. And we've worked within uh, many different countries. Before we dig into the applications, let's have a quick refresher on what distributed fiber sensing is. Let's recap on the first principles. An interrogator unit is plugged onto the end of a fiber. A pulse of laser light is launched down the fiber and some of this light is returned from the glass back to the star. This light carries a characteristic signature of the glass due to tiny refractive index variations. As we're sensed at speed of light, we can repeat the interrogation thousands of times a second, and we can split up the returning information into thousands of bins to monitor each point con continuously. And on the bottom uh, graph there that we can see, the, um, the <coughs> strain is modified by, uh, sorry, the signature is modified by local strain or vibrations. And this allows us to build a rich tapestry of information along the fiber cable that is responsive to changes in the surrounding environment. As the technology has advanced, there are now a number of different interrogation techniques which give rise to either qualitative data or quantitative data. Qualitative interrogator units typically use a single launch pulse and measure the intensity of the signal at each point along the fiber and are perfect for certain applications where you, you merely wish to detect something is happening. For higher fidelity applications where you want to measure um, precise information, later generation interrogator units are needed. These send out more complex launch pulses and unwrap the phase and amplitude information from the return signal, which allows more tangible outputs to be provided. Um, shining a light on, on applications such as monitoring a condition uh, of an asset. And the videos here show the relationship really well. So on the, the left-hand side here, we've got our qualitative uh, intensity-based signal. As the train passes here, there's not really any pattern observable in the data other than telling you that the train is passing. If we look at the quantitative system, you see the train passing and you can see a pattern uh, within the information. 
that looks to relate to the strains uh, of each passing uh, bogey. Uh, this is a, a well-worn slide for FOSA webinars. I'm not going to go into too much detail here on the different backscatter types, other than to say that different types of backscatter give us different pieces of valuable information. For this webinar, the focus will predominantly be on distributed relay sensing. Using a qualitative interrogator unit measuring relay backscatter um, on a typically used loose tube fibre, we can detect vibrations uh, from noise sources around the fibre, such as highway vehicles. However, using a quantitative interrogator unit combined with a, a, a newly installed tight buffered cable coupled closely to the asset, that opens up the possibility of measuring a static strain as well. And note, with this particular method, the, you need to isolate the effect of temperature changes uh, as well but static strain can be a useful measure and for condition monitoring. There are a number of really helpful technology primers on the FOSA website, uh, which are a great aid for learning further into the different types of backscatter and the different types of uh, sensing approaches. As with other industries, the pace of technological changes is having a huge impact on the highways industry. And it's, it's worthwhile just having a look at some of the, uh, the advancements and the pace of change. In the early 1900s, the automobile's popularity was on the rise. Um, looking at that tilting automobile, there was still a bit of work needed on uh, suspension. Um, in 1912, the first electric traffic light was deployed in Utah, in Salt Lake City. In the 1950s, the first variable message signs were deployed on New Jersey Turnpike uh, to give feedback to road users. And by the 1990s, there were a lot more sophisticated systems uh, were being developed of automatic incident detection to warn road users by variable message signs of upcoming traffic incidents. Uh, one such system is the MIDAS system in the UK, which is based on two induction loops being buried in the pavement surface, uh, typically 1,600 feet um, apart and in each individual lane. The loops detect vehicles crossing and as the space in between the two loops is known, a speed can be estimated. A trigger can then be set for a slow moving vehicle, which activates a sequence of changing the road signs to reduce the speed limit of arriving traffic to prevent any um, further accidents or, or new accidents uh, occurring from the free flowing traffic coming into the back of the congested or queuing traffic. Into the, uh, into the 2000s and the changes begin to escalate. So with the availability of more accurate civilian um, satellite net information, it was quickly adopted into sat-nav devices for vehicles and uh, you know I think that many would agree that driving to a new destination has never been uh, less stressful these days. We also started to see revolutionary changes to the propulsion of vehicles with the emergence of widely available electric cars or, or hybrid propulsion cars. 2010s, we started to see the rise of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications. For instance, cars further along the highway turning their fog lights on would, could warn nearby vehicles um, that there are upcoming foggy conditions and to be cautious. And finally, the rollout of the 5G network is happening now. This has been well publicised in the Associated Press, but the 5G network uh, will provide the speed, low latency and connectivity to enable a number of applications. One of these will be the potential for self-driving vehicles, um, others will be the, the communication of any device to each other. The rollout will increase the amount of fibre optic network, but also means the importance of these assets could increase further 
some of the applications being run on the 5G mobile network could be so critical that the protection of the fibre is vital. I won't discuss it during this webinar, but there are a number of security applications that fibre sensing can provide to protect this critical asset from accidental, say from construction work, or malicious damage. I know this graphic is a very simplistic overview and it's not exhaustive, but hopefully it does show that the winds of change are blowing through the industry. And since the turn of the century, technology options have multiplied and innovation has been growing. So it's not so much as an evolution, but a revolution now. And it also shows the importance our fiber optic cables have in this revolution. Members of FOSA are aware of the magic of fiber optic sensing technologies. And I wanna share how distributed fiber sensing currently is playing a part in this transformation and where it can in the future. Let us look at the distributed fiber sensing solutions available today. Traffic management. As can be seen with these headlines, managing traffic is a big issue. With increasing population and the demand for mobility growing, the stresses placed on highways and other transport networks intensifies. Optimal use of road infrastructure is vital to managing the impact of rapidly increasing traffic volumes and minimizing congestion. There is an ongoing battle of increasing vehicles and subsequently traffic on roads and the introduction of traffic management measures, technologies and innovations. And in some regions and areas where a focus on improving the traffic management has been, there is evidence that congestion is reducing, such as this, this headline about congestion delays have decreased in four of the five most congested cities in the US. So I want to explore in more detail some of the available traffic sensors or data sources and some of the considerations required on assessing the value they provide. There are a number of in-pavement sensors, such as inductive loops that we mentioned uh, previously in the MIDAS system or piezoelectric sensors. There are also technologies such as radar, microwave sensors or cameras with video analytics that are located roadside. Depending on the application, some of the sensors are mounted um, by the side of the road, whilst others have to be mounted above the highway on gantries, bridges, or other infrastructure spanning the highway of interest. Pro data refers to data obtained from the vehicle, whether that is from the onboard vehicle system or from data generated from a mobile phone traveling within the vehicle. For all these technologies, there are a number of considerations. Initial expenditure is, is important, as is the deployment density, the reliability and availability of the data, and the repair and the replacement schedules of the technology are also necessary considerations. The availability of the data is linked in part to who owns the data, which is also a big consideration. And finally, the periodic maintenance requirements uh, and the in-service performance are all uh, factors that have to be assessed. Distributed fiber sensing provides a novel approach of providing valuable traffic monitoring information. And this, this infographic summarizes it. So it does it by converting an existing single mode um, roadside optical fiber into a traffic sensor. The equipment stack can be located in a telecoms node or also in a roadside cabinet. And th this means that any equipment maintenance can be achieved without the need for any costly lane or road closures. This provides a number of informative traffic management outputs that could be harnessed to notify highway users in variable message signs and or uh, to traffic operations center. So let's see the sensor data collected and how it can be transformed into valuable information. Uh, to help orientate yourself with this video, the top window shows a waterfall image. 
This is widely used in distributed fiber sensing. The x-axis is system channels, which can be translated to distance. And here it shows an area of approximately 6.2 miles or 10 kilometers. The y-axis is time, and in this video is showing about a minute. And the, the waterfall is a zoomed section of the area below. Uh, the colors relate to the levels of energy between 20 hertz and 200 hertz, white being lower level through shades of gray to higher level black. And each of the black lines that you see at a gradient are vehicles on the road. The darker, thicker lines are likely to be trucks, whilst the lighter, thinner uh, lines are cars. The bottom window uh, just shows our graphical user um, in, uh, interface to help visualize um, the traffic information. So it takes the sensor information and it converts it into uh, different useful traffic information such as speed, congestion and stationary queue in traffic information. The green color show that the traffic speed is running normally and the colors change through yellow orange and red as the speed reduces. Overlaying over the speed information are alarms that pop up showing congestion or queuing traffic. Okay, so let, let's play the video. So here we see a slow moving vehicle convoy, which was actually carrying a wind turbine in a two lane uh, carriageway uh, or roadway, say. The slow moving vehicle has a pilot vehicle that um, allows whether vehicles can overtake or not. And what we see here is that the slow traffic starts to build up a lot behind the wide load vehicle. And this keeps slowing down, which then uh, shows itself on the user interface as displaying slower speeds, amber and red. Here is when the pilot vehicle starts to allow vehicles to overtake. So you see this release of the congestion behind and the traffic starts to flow freely in front. And you can see as it starts to move back uh, down the peloton, wrong word, but uh, as it moves, moves back. Um, so they're allowed to, to, to do pass safely. And on the user interface, you can see that now the congestion uh, is clearing and the speeds and the colors are returning back to the normal green conditions. Now you get an idea of how the underlying data can be transformed into valuable speed data. Let's have a look at some of the other outputs from a fiber sensing based uh, traffic mo um, monitoring uh, solution. The speed output that was shown on the user interface is every 165 feet, excuse me, and it's updated each second. The output can be isolated for different roadways, which is carriageways, uh, sort of what we say in the UK, and it is an aggregate of the cars detected in all lanes for that roadway. By looking at some of the patterns within the sensor data and the output average speed data, there's also some further powerful outputs that we can produce. So congestion detection of slow moving vehicles can be output with a start and end of the congested areas, which is updated every second. Queue detection of stationary traffic, again, can be updated every second, every 165 feet. Travel time is currently output between each highway intersection on our user interface. But taking the underlying speed output on an external interface, travel times could be dynamically calculated for any sections of interest along the monitored route. The regions where the fiber crossings occur, like perpendicular across the, the, the highway, a vehicle count can be output. And for an existing fiber that runs alongside, say, a freeway, this happens many times where you have intersections as the fiber crosses on or off ramps. And for, for, for this application, a number of different validation and verification exercises have been completed. 
and are in the public domain that show you know the outputs of, of five assessing uh, five percent sorry for traffic management are accurate the top left shows an independent analysis done uh, in sweden which was compared to their existing sensors and showed close alignment with speeds in both free flowing traffic conditions and slow moving traffic conditions the top right shows an assessment conducted at the UK Tunnel Detection System testbed for traffic monitoring. And it shows that the requirements uh, that they stipulated in the table uh, were met for both slow moving congested traffic and stationary queuing traffic events that occurred over a uh, three month period of, of assessment. The bottom left shows a project within the US where a novel use of social media updates was used to help provide ground truth of events that were occurring and to verify the system's congestion and, and queuing outputs. Uh, and finally, the bottom right shows an independent analysis done in the Netherlands that compared the fiber sensing outputs to existing methods and showed a uh, really great alignment. So the green line shows the fiber sensing output and the blue, the existing technology. And it clearly showed that, that all of the major uh, traffic trends um, are captured. Let us now look at the role distributed fiber sensing can have in tomorrow's world. A hot topic is highway pavement condition monitoring. It's known that weather cycles create stress and strain on all construction materials and highways are no different and climate change is predicted to increase the amount of weather extremes placing a greater stress and strain on the highway network. Highways are national assets that make a, a crucial contribution to society. They contribute to the movement of people and goods around they aid the mobility of the emergency services, ambulances, police and firefighters, and in some places they form part of vital evacuation routes from incoming natural disasters such as hurricanes. And pavement maintenance is important now. Maintaining these assets is important to ensure that these functions can continue. And it also contributes to lower vehicle operating costs for road users. A common severe pavement defect, like the pothole shown uh, here, creates a lot of damage to vehicle suspension, wheels and other components. For many critical highway routes, maintenance contracts are in place with service level agreements to ensure that roads are maintained in a good condition. And there is an increase in desire to use technology to help with the maintenance strategy. Crucially, with the ongoing rapid technological advancements in the road industry, including the prospect of self-driving vehicles, this condition monitoring will still be important. Self-driving vehicles will look to optimise the driving of individual vehicles and the traffic flow as a whole. This could, for instance, lead to a reduced driving distance between cars which imparts more strain onto the pavement surface. Each car could also position itself perfectly in the middle of a lane, which again could lead to a smaller portion of the road receiving significantly more strain from the traffic. At the very minimum, road condition monitoring will still be very important for the foreseeable future. There are a number of areas of research which are going on with employing uh, DFOS, distributed fiber optical sensing for road condition monitoring. A split of the research using DFOS breaks into using an existing fiber optic cable that runs along the, alongside the highway or installing a new cable within the road surface. Using an existing fiber optic cable allows you to measure dynamic strain and build up a picture of the spectral energy occurring by uh, vehicles traveling over the highway surface. The location away from the highway negates any conflict with routine maintenance schedules on the highway whilst it leverages the existing asset. 
Installing within the road surface allows the possibility of a tight buffered fibre cable as opposed to a loose tube cable and this in enables the glass core to be tightly coupled with the outside of the cable uh, construct, um, enabling the possibility of static strain to be measured. This is another measure and um, that could help unlock the condition of the highway. A pothole is a depression in the pavement surface where typically traffic has removed broken pieces of the pavement surface. A distributed fibre sensing can detect potholes as cars transit across the road surface. And in this video that I'm going to show here, again, we are looking at a waterfall window showing approximately 20 miles of highway being monitored, and the y axis uh, shows 30 seconds of time. So what we can see here is that when we zoom in, you can see that in some areas, the vehicles generate transient like signatures that radiate out before and after the vehicle. Potholes are typically one of the more significant defects suffered on roads, and a lot of money is spent each year in maintaining them before they develop into even bigger hazards. There are a number of other failure mechanisms that gradually build and left unchecked develop into potholes. So it would be hugely valuable to be able to detect earlier signs of wear and fatigue on the <clears throat> pavement surface before developing into potholes, as the ma maintenance required is, is typically less uh, costly. Let's look now at some of the information collected by an existing roadside fibre being interrogated by a quantitative system. The waters full display uh, sums frequency bands together and as already shown, it's a useful tool in showing the general pattern of life on the asset, on the, on the road. And we can see vehicle movements here. It also shows differences in the background noise along the route, which could be due to fibre uh, position or fibre installation method or, or just background noise conditions. But behind the waterfall there is a wealth of other data. So here we can see all of the frequency content along the, the <clears throat> highway at a given time with the energy in, in the uh, frequency bins represented as colour with reds being higher level moving through oranges and yellows to lower level blues. The temporal and spatially rich data set allows the energy changes to be monitored over time. And by using similar approaches, we have been able to see a, a reduction in an energy level after a damaged road has been resurfaced in, in research that we have done. The damaged road did not reach the severity of potholes and was deemed to be moderately damaged, but the, the research is, is encouraging. From customer feedback in Europe, a newly resurfaced uh, freeway pavement surface typically won't show sign of degradation for at least five years. But maybe with ongoing research, fibre sensing can be a valuable component of a pavement asset monitoring strategy. A highway consists of many layers, including the pavement surface. They are all connected. Many defects in the road surface, sorry, pavement surface, are triggered by changes in the subgrade. There is also a concern that the impact of climate change will lead to increasingly extreme weather conditions. This could lead to flash flooding events occurring um, normally, which would add additional strain onto the road networks. In other areas, what is seen as previously normal conditions are increasingly becoming uh, abnormal. An example is the increased warming in the Arctic regions. The status of permafrost layers is becoming increasingly variable, and these will likely modify the ways highways are constructed and maintained in these regions. Monitoring changes that occur in the subsurface 
is increasingly desirable to help our understanding of the effects, but also to potentially warn road users of upcoming hazards. Near surface characterization using fiber sensing has been researched and has been used within the oil field services industry for a number of years. These have involved using active seismic sources with accurate timings, which have enabled processing methods to be uh, developed and adopted that build a picture of the subsurface. Recently, research attention is turning to the more complex challenge of using passive sources such as cars or lorries um, to, to provide the seismic information. And in this waterfall picture here, we see a vehicle slowing down. And what you can see uh, in this very low frequency uh, plot is that you can see energy propagated in front and behind of the, uh, the vehicle. There is a number of signal processing steps uh, to take the data um, and, and turn it into something tangible, but there's a number of research which has been uh, done within this area and is ongoing. And one of the, the pieces of work that has been uh, done is a near surface characterization using a fiber sensing array um, by Stanford University. But as we showed previously um, before, on the left-hand side, in quantitative data, you can see surface waves radiating from uh, road vehicles. If we look in the middle with data processing, the velocity can be picked um, at each location. This velocity curve fit is important in the accuracy of the final plot, which shows the different speeds with uh, propagating through different materials. And at, on the middle plot, as the speed varies in different mediums, you can start to pick out uh, differences. And on the far plot, sorry, for example, this inverted uh, velocity model shows it's plotting changes with, with depth, and it shows that there are typically deposits to about eight uh, meters, uh, about 25 feet, and harder rock below. These techniques you know, could possibly be used to chart the position of the water table or permafrost, which could become increasingly important uh, with climate change. So to, to summarize, fiber optic networks are growing as the infrastructure for 5G mobile networks roll out. Many of these will be alongside highways. Distributed fiber sensing can transform this fiber into traffic monitoring sensors today. Research is ongoing to assess the value fiber sensing can provide in monitoring the pavement condition and indeed the near surface layers. And finally, we didn't touch on it uh, much today with the research that's ongoing in embedded fibers. Um, but there's some papers which are due to be released shortly, notable work from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory um, and their collaboration with the University of California's Pavement Research Center, um, which are, who are due to release a, a paper imminently. So over the coming years, there is a real opportunity to optimize the value that the fiber rollout can provide to highway users and traffic operation centers. Thanks a lot for your time and for listening. Well, thank you, Andy, and thank you. I know we'll have a, a number of questions, but uh, let me kick off with one that we got right at the outset. You you talked about different uh, uh, installation methodologies on, in the roadway and off the roadway. Um, can you give us a better sense of uh, sort of how many lanes uh, a, a single fiber can, can um, uh, monitor? Sure. Um, so recent work that we have done within the US has been monitoring uh, a freeway which has got over all eight lanes and the, uh, the fiber varied from about 30 foot to 45 foot 
from the edge of the pavement. And in that setup, we were able to, to monitor uh, traffic and different traffic events over both of the different uh, carriageways or, or roadways. And I, I guess a related question to that is, can you count or uh, monitor the number of wheels on a car passing a road? Yes, yeah, so that's a, um, a great question. So there has been some work on the perpendicular crossings. So when we have got a parallel uh, fibre, you can't at the moment typically make out um, the, the, the different wheels uh, moving. You could see some sort of evidence if there was a pothole that generated an impact. You could see sort of double impacts um, in the video shown earlier. But in order to do like a reliable and robust uh, count of the wheels, which could lead to applications such as vehicle classification, you would need a, a perpendicular fibre or fibres to be able to, to do it. And a, a related installation question is how many miles of road can be covered with a single uh, piece of equipment? And, um, so it, yeah, so we have, um, so for a, a, a typical equipment uh, stack, we could monitor um, 50 miles, so 25 miles in each direction uh, from that equipment stack. And uh, let me see if I've got this right, is uh, what is the spatial resolution? Um, so, this is a sort of common uh, question, I, I, I guess. So one of the trade-offs that you have with, uh, with, with fiber sensing is the, the range that you wish to monitor and the, the underlying, uh, say, spatial resolution of that uh, optical configuration that you've set up. So broadly, to do that um, for 25 miles, you know, it's typically in the, in the region of about 15, uh, meters, so uh, maybe 45 feet, something like that. And related to that, kind of as a follow-up, does, does the equipment have to be in a cabinet? Does it have to be, can it be housed in a cabinet in the field? Does it need to be in a facility somewhere in a, a sort of specialized room? Um, so it can be in, in either. So we have had some, uh, so, so there's been some fibre sense in projects where the equipment has been um, in an uh, equipment room away from the road and there's been a lead in fibre cable uh, to the, the highway. Or there's also been uh, some installations where they have just uh, provided a roadside cubicle, um, made sure that, you know, all of the power requirements um, have been met and they've made sure that it's climate controlled from uh, weather extremes, both hot and cold, and um, you know, systems have been, uh, uh, have been fine and they're in specification. And a follow up to the earlier question about the number of lanes detected, do you need uh, two cables to monitor, say, northbound or southbound lanes, so lanes going in opposite directions? Um, no, so we um, we can differentiate. So the gradients of the lines that you could see on the sort of earlier waterfall, um, we assume that that driving direction means that they're in those respective carriageways. But we can um, we can differentiate those and provide uh, an output for both directions with a fibre on one side of the uh, the highway. And uh, a frequent question we get is, is can you use the fiber for other purposes? This is, this is a, a recurring question on our webinars. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the fiber cable, um, you can. So if you've got a number of cores within there, so uh, like a 24, 36 or 48 core, then, um, you know, all of the other cores you, know, you can use for communication uh, purposes. But for the purpose of, um, for, for fiber sensing for, for our technology, you would uh, have a, a spare core that would be needed for, um, to do the traffic monitoring. Um, obviously for the road condition monitoring, some of the research areas that are looking 
at putting in uh, a fiber cable into the road surface um, at the moment they are looking at tightly buffered cables which only have a call for sensing and so here's a follow-up question I, I think we talked a little bit about uh, installation but uh, uh, how does uh, fiber optic cable installation affect the uh, sensing signal and I guess the question really is is uh, does it need to have good contact uh, with the surrounding uh, soil or uh, with the uh, pavement? Yeah, so it, it depends very much on what the uh, the application is. For all of the, um, I mean, first of all, for relay sensing, um, the technology is very sensitive, uh, which is a, a good start in place. Um, and for traffic monitoring applications uh, that were presented, it's quite robust um, for a number of different sort of installation methods that have been that are used sort of operationally within the US. So um, typically, you know, we have seen that uh, fiber is buried maybe within a surrounding, so the cable is buried within a surrounding conduit. And typically that might be uh, about between sort of three and six feet or three and 10 feet uh, down in depth and um, you know sometimes they put that on the extremities of their uh, property so on the edge of the right of way which means that you know it could be sort of 30 feet away but for traffic monitoring applications um, the, 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 the signals generated from the moving vehicles uh, are very high level and have meant that even with that type of environment we have uh, been able to see uh, traffic which is moving maybe 10 or 12 lanes away you know from from the fiber so you know long distances I, I would suggest for the condition monitoring um, applications there's some that can be done uh, with with that setup but distance I would think would be more um, uh, of an effect or have more of an effect and then for those where you look at uh, monitoring static strain you need a very tight coupling so you need to be very close uh, to the surface that you're interested in. So you'd have to be within the pavement surface. Um, you may be able to do it, and, and it, this area is still very much in basic research. You know, you may be able to do it so that you are still in the surface, but off of the active uh, area. But the more that you change that uh, distance for, for those, the more that uh, there's more sort of uh, complications with um, unlocking the, the static strain that you're interested in. So really this question sort of elaborates on that. Uh, how much cable armor uh, for highway installation? Uh, tight buffer, coated buffer, jacketed? Um, so again, I would say typical for, for use in, in, in the US um, is that the fiber cable itself is within conduits. So um, normally they have maybe a light armor or, or no armor and um, you know again these have uh, effects but within the commissioning of systems the baseline is set you know against all of, uh, of these different changes that, that you see so that's the important thing is that once the, the system is commissioned it's baselined that the normal conditions are known and then you can then start to look for um the, the the changes to the pattern of life of the things that you're interested in and i think you've kind of just answered the next question but i'll, I'll get it out which is are you limited by noise so is there background noise or uh, other interference is is that so i think what you're saying is you're able to, to establish a baseline and then screen that out yeah yeah um and uh yeah you you do exactly so you screen out uh, other uh noise uh, sources that that you have and typically within the, the the road environment you know you've got a lead in so if you had like a a, a noisy area say of like construction work that's happening close to the, the the traffic um you've got both sides of that construction area you know as well so that you've got the signal from there and a lot of the algorithms looking at classifying the speeds, you know, take in that spatially rich information uh, to make sure that they reliably and robustly output, um, you know, the measure that you're interested in. Now, we had some interest in your uh, pothole in, uh, illustration. 
Uh, but the question is, is uh, how do you distinguish between uh, pavement joints and other sort of uh, artifacts in the road from the actual pothole? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. And it goes into um, some of this uh, work on baselining. Um, so, you know, you can you can remotely make some uh, deductions about that. So, first of all, you know, you do get some uh, benign road features which create impacts, as as was mentioned in the question. Um, but you know, what you can do is you can see, for example, whether they are still present for traffic moving in both um both directions and you know if they're not that would insinuate that it's on one of the the road carriageways you can then get a feel as well for you know how often they happen to um so if it's happening all of the time for every single vehicle passes you know then it, it's likely to be a uh, benign feature but when you're commissioning systems you can go out look at these and set the baseline and then from that point on you can look for any changes that uh, that potentially occur uh, along there and the next one uh, have you had done any work with uh, geotextile uh no not currently but i'd be interested to uh, to find out more <laughs> uh, offline so yeah, please contact me. <laughs> Sounds like a follow-up is necessary there. Let me see. Yeah. Um, uh, to monitor both sides of a uh, highway, 24 miles in each direction, as you mentioned, is it monitored at the same time or do you use a uh, uh, optical switch to monitor one side and then switch to the other side? Um, no, so it's, uh, it's effectively, uh, two you know lasers looking in in the different directions so you have two systems effectively um which would be working uh, at the same time independently good let me see i think we've come to the end of the questions i think uh equipment passing i think we've hit some of them a little bit uh repetitive to the other ones um, I will say a sort of a recurring question that we can address for folks is the uh, fact that the full presentation will be available on our uh, uh, YouTube uh, page uh, our channel I should say uh, for FOSA YouTube page and uh, obviously that's a great opportunity to see it again but also to uh, refer to uh, your colleagues and friends uh, uh, for uh, uh, more information and uh, I also, you obviously have the um, contact information for uh, for Andy, uh, and uh, he can follow up with uh, some additional questions. But Andy, thank you very much for what has been a very uh, informative uh, uh, presentation. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And that concludes this broadcast.